introverted noise. Hurry up, Daddy. Let's do it. Rolls out to the right. Five seconds to go in the first half. Dante fires deep to the left. Moss caught it at the 11, but now he oh, pitches look at it. This. To oh, Mo Williams. Williams. Touchdown! You got it, big All right, and welcome back to another episode of the Climbing the Pocket Podcast. I am your host, Jason Brown. You can find me on Twitter at Brown Jason. And we're back. We got the usual crew, everybody in their normal seats, and we are ready to do this thing. So uh, we're going to jump right into it. QB1, how you doing? How you been? No, no, right, man. Watching this terrible Raiders 49ers game, the Raiders absolutely stink. They, they are bad. They are, they are really, really, really bad. But, you know, they got a bunch of draft picks, so I'm sure Gruden will get them, you know, on track at some point. <laughs> he Maybe. has no choice. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, they got no choice. He's locked in for 100 mil. So. Didn't you hear everybody wants to be in Oakland? I mean, John Gruden? They want to be in Las Vegas. Well, Eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. Wide receiver one. What's How you up? doing, man? Good, just you really been, busy, man. You've been really on the road a lot these days, man. You know, racking up them miles. Yeah, man. Lots of lots of stuff going on. Work's been busy. Life's been busy. Busy's busy's better than not busy, though. Especially for work. You'd rather be busy than not. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> and the man, the myth, the legend, big spending, Saxy Prince. How you doing? Yeah, man. What'd you, you pick know? up this week, man? Oh, nothing. You know, I'm, uh, you know, the bank account is uh, still pretty green, but it's uh, a lot lot, lot lower than it was, you know, a couple weeks ago. So, you know, I got to I got to slow down on the spending and whatnot. Saxophone, new saxophone plays good. I took it to the shop, had it tuned up and whatnot so that it plays at the level I needed to. So, yeah, we're going to we're going to get saxy here real soon. You know, good stuff. Good stuff. Did you pick up that uh, salute to service jacket that I was looking at? Send, send Send that up this way. Not, not, not yet. I, okay. I'll get that real soon. Okay, I'm going to you to work on that. Work mm-hmm. on that. Well, well, Prince, I'm going to turn it over to you because I feel like you were asking people questions or something. There was some kind of trivia business. I was away from the computer, but, you know, I'm not sure what what it was you were doing or what you were you're trying to give away or whatever. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can talk about whatever it is you were doing when you were asking about JR's stats or whatever it was you was doing out there on the timeline. Oh, yeah. Um. So, you know, I... uh. You know, I have my um, uh, premiere tomorrow, so I wanted to give uh, some tickets away. So the question was, um, how many, uh, what's the most that uh, JR has uh, passing yards he's had in, you know, single game? You know, what's his, what's, what's his highest one? And we had a lot, a lot of uh, responses, but the answer actually is 292 passing yards in a single game. Uh, JR went off in that game. You know, he's our Q, there's a reason why he's our QB1. Um, <clears throat> we had a lot of responses, and it looks like the winner is uh, Amanda, um, aka at Revy Cat. So, you know, congratulations to Amanda. We'll get to you tickets. Send send it to you. Uh, we'll DM you uh, during or after the show or whatnot. So, uh, congratulations to you. Bring a friend. Good stuff. Good stuff. And if you'd like to see some highlights of Jr., click in the show notes. We got QB one out there doing his thing, showing you that wonderful pocket presence, that form, a little bit of that, uh, you know, elusiveness, as he was known to do, that breakaway speed, touch, <laughs> all that stuff, everything you want in your in your in a quarterback. Jr. was out there giving it to you, and we got some highlights for you to check it out. Throwback Thursday highlights of the man, the myth, the legend, the QB one. Yeah, I do everything he does, just slower. So, <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So we will uh, we'll keep things moving along. <laughs> and uh, we did it. We did a recap show this week. We got back into that, but we had a different crew. You know, we had myself, we had Yinka, but then we had the pocket protector guys in. So before we get to this week and and some some of the things that have been going on on Vikings Twitter, Jr. Start with you. What were your thoughts on uh, on the Saints game? Kurt's performance, team overall. And uh, kind of coming out of that game, I guess we're at the midpoint of things. How are you feeling about the season going forward? Well, I kind of had a weird feeling after the game because it seemed like an ugly loss at first. But looking back at it, they didn't play that bad as it seemed after the game. I guess I got a little bit caught up in the game. 
um, and just my feelings afterwards towards the game because there really was only three or four plays that really separated the two teams in the game. Obviously, the Thielen fumble before the half seemed to deflate the team in the second half, and they just didn't look to have that same type of energy, that same type of urgency that they had in the first half. And then the deflating eight-minute drive that the Saints ended up scoring on there in the, in the second half as well. So those were the two biggest differences in the game. But as a whole, I don't think the Vikings played that bad. I thought their defense played really well for the most part, holding Drew Brees to as many passing yards as they did. I believe it was only about 120-something or something along those lines. It was really low. Um, but the running game, the rushing attack for the Saints did pick up a little bit. Mark Ingram had some really good runs, and they did a great job of using Alvin Kamara out of the backfield. And it's something that the Vikings defense has really struggled with, uh, just talking about guarding running backs out of the backfield. And that's something Sean Pay Payton started to see as the game went on. He started to get Alvin Kamara more involved, especially in the second half. I know he had a missed opportunity on the touchdown uh, where Eric Kendricks was guarding him. So, we started to see him make some adjustments coming out of the half, and the Vikings just really didn't make those adjustments offensively, and they just didn't have a real sense of urgency in the second half. It just seemed like it took them forever to score, and then you had to deflate in Kirk Cousins' interception. Uh, you can blame it on whoever you want to blame it on, uh, whether that's Stephon Diggs or Kirk Cousins. They turned the ball over in a crucial moment right there, and that really sealed the win for the Saints. So overall, I'm not too discouraged about it looking back at it, but – these next three games are really huge because they're divisional games, and I think they have to go 3-0 in these next three to salvage the season. We're really going to find out what type of team the Vikings are here in November. Yeah, and so you mentioned something. There's a couple of things, I guess, that I, I, I wanted to ask you about, and then I get Miles' opinion as we kind of move forward here, is that uh, the sense of urgency piece, because I know myself, I kind of felt that way, and when I was rewatching the game, it didn't really feel like, you know, the team was was moving, you know, as urgently as they needed to, especially on that scoring drive at the end where it felt like they took forever to get down the field and no one really seemed to be rushing, even though they were, you know, down by a lot at that point. But I also feel a little bit like on that series where the pick six happened, Kurt Cousins seemed a little like frenetic, a little sped up, a little, I don't know, something seemed off with him on that particular drive where he almost threw a pick six to a linebacker. He scrambled out of the pocket for some reason, didn't throw the ball away, had it stripped. It was ruled a fumble then overturned. And then like a couple plays later, we have the, you know, kind of blind throw to a spot that ends up as a, you know, a pick six dig stops. Cousin didn't really see where he was throwing like all that. Like that series Kirk didn't seem to be, I don't know, as a quarterback, maybe you could help me explain like what was going on with him. Cause he just seemed sped up or something. Um, and, and uncomfortable, even when he had clean pockets. Yeah, and it just seemed like that he was rushed in the second half, and I think you're spot on with that. And that's something that we've seen with Kirk Cousins. You can really tell when his mind is sped up, and you can tell by the way he's patting the ball. That's really been a telltale. Me and Jason were discussing that the other day, that defensive linemen are really starting to key in on when he's about to release the ball because they'll pat it. It's called burping the baby in quarterback terms. That's something that you don't want to do because it's given away when you're about to launch the ball. And we saw Cameron Jordan get a couple tip passes uh, just by that. And you can see Kirk Cousins never really settled in in the second half. I thought he looked comfortable for the most part uh, when he was targeting Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs in the first half, but he never really settled in and got comfortable in that second half. And that's just kudos to the Saints defensive line for getting after him. I mean, <laughs> they made Sheldon Rankins look like Aaron Donald at some points throughout the game. And just taking those hits like that will really fluster you. And once you don't really trust your offensive line up front, it really speeds up the game for you. And we all know that Kirk Cousins doesn't already have a great mental clock in his head right now because he will hang on to the ball longer than he's supposed to sometimes. So he just never really got comfortable. And that's something that you never really adjust to throughout the game because – you don't really trust what's in front of you. He trusts his receivers out wide, but he just didn't really trust the guys in front of him for multiple reasons because the Saints were getting so much pressure on him throughout the game. Okay, that makes sense. And Miles, I guess from your perspective, what were your thoughts on the game overall, Kirk Cousins' performance? Because again, it was one of those things where Kurt's box stats look amazing, but the fan base, when you were kind of looking at things on on you know Twitter, Facebook, wherever afterwards seemed a little uneasy about, you know, his game overall. What was your feeling about kind of how he played um, and then just the game and what you see kind of moving forward? 
Yeah, I, it really looked like, for me, Kirk Cousins, once that fumble by I, – I thought that first half before that fumble by Adam Thielen, Kirk Cousins and, that off, and the offense in general were playing really good football. They looked like they were moving the ball. They were con- I think they converted a couple third downs. They obviously scored. Um, they, they looked like they were making some plays and they were establishing something. And they were looking like to the point where they're ready to take – Take that next step before half, you know, score before the half. Whether it was a, you know, we knew we knew that that the play that Adam Thielen fumbled, we knew that hypothetically that they were going to score, whether it was a touchdown or a fumble, because of the position they were in right before the half. And I thought the offense was playing well. It looked like that they were ready to to take that step, and then that all happened. I thought Kirk Cousins was playing really well, and then that fumble happened, and it looked like. It wasn't just Kirk. It looked like the whole offense as a whole just kind of deflated. Um, yes, is it his job to pick that pick things back up? Definitely, because he's the quarterback. He's the catalyst. He's the driver of the bus. Um, but it didn't happen. That that second half really looked like they just they they felt like they lost that game after that fumble. Whether you want to believe that or not, that's the way they looked. That's the way they treated it. Um, and Kirk's sense of urgency in that second half. And him getting skittish in the pocket really showed that, and that was that was definitely a big, a big tell. And it was it was unfortunate because you were hoping that they could reestablish themselves because they're only down by four at halftime, um, even even though they should have been up, but they still were on, they were still within a you know four points. That's that's not a big deal in the NFL. Um, it's just the way that it happened. So maybe if maybe if they were down seventeen to thirteen and in, going into half and and in a different manner, maybe things would have been different, but it really felt like once that fumble happened that everybody deflated. Um, and that second half, Kirk Cousins just kind of, uh, it was, I wouldn't even call it trying to make plays. And yeah, maybe it was, there were some times like that, that interception trying to make a play. Um, there might've been a little bit of that trying to do too much of things, but it really felt like overall that they were just, they just didn't seem like they they felt confident after that after everything and you know that interception showed it that like that last drive that you guys were talking about really showed that so it just it just it just felt like they weren't comfortable in that second half and that that comfort level really decreased to the point where they just weren't they just didn't look like a <clears throat> no, I'm not going to say they didn't look like a good team but they just didn't look like the normal Vikings that we're used to seeing and it was really disheartening yeah, and, and so, I mean, you brought up a point that it's something we talked about last season, really, and, you know, it's it's coming up again, you know, in you know in this situation here where you have a game and you don't want to take, you know, too much or make too much out of, you know, one game, but it's things that, you know, have kind of popped up here and there throughout the season. Um, like, who who are the who are the leaders on the offense? Like, who who are the people that, that we should be looking to in situations like this to – you know, get the team, you know, fired up. And I didn't see any sideline shots. Maybe Yankee can say because he was at the game. Like, if he could, if he saw anything, um, you know, I didn't see any sideline shots or anything like that. So I don't know what was going on when the cameras weren't looking that way. But it just seems as though, uh, like, we need someone to to kind of take over as as yeah, the basically the leader on 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 that side of the ball. Um, and, and again, as a conversation that we had last year, where um, it seemed at times that that might have been missing. Uh, I guess what's your perspective on that when you see something like that in a game like this where just, yeah, the team ends up flat and, like, nobody. It just didn't seem like anybody on that side of the ball was really about getting them super fired back up. Yeah, I mean, the obvious answer here is the quarterback's got to be the one to rally everybody. Whether And it doesn't have to be being a rah-rah person. It doesn't have to be this go make sure everybody's okay, go make sure you boost everybody's confidence up on the sidelines. It doesn't have to be that. But your play on the field, like having that, having that calm demeanor, having that going about your business, and just getting back to back to the basics, getting back to how your offense should roll, no matter what the score is. Having a, a better understanding of the clock, having a better understanding of your internal clock, like Jr. said earlier, that something that Cousins has really struggled with that internal clock of getting the ball out of his hands, just little things like that of getting the of getting back into that groove to getting the offense's uh, confidence back. And it didn't really seem like once we got in that second half 
that Kirk Cousins did that. He didn't seem to calm himself down. So you could see it in the rest of the offense that they weren't calm. They didn't seem – they seemed more like they, – they looked like they were pressing more, more than they should be because nobody seemed calm. Everybody seemed like they had this sense of panic. And it, it really hurt – and it, like, like we said, it really hurt the offense. And I think that starts with the quarterback. And it doesn't have to be that rah rah. It just has to be a lead by example, doing, getting your team back to a, an even keeled, level level headed situation where everybody can just calm themselves down. No matter what happened in that first half, we're still in this game. This game's not out of reach, and it, yeah, it didn't really seem like they did that. All right, so that dovetails perfectly into kind of the next thing that I, I wanted to get to really quick because JR brought it up. You kind of talked about it a little bit, and it's something that Vikings fans, generally speaking, have been very charged up about in that you know, Kirk Cousins you know, has throughout the season. I think JR posted today he's taken the most hits or been pressured the most out of any quarterback. And so in this particular situation, like the second half, the Saints, you know, pass rush, did start to get to cousins a little bit more, you know, Sheldon Rankins was in there balling bench pressing our guys and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that, that led to some conversations some talk today in particular about, um, well, it's not, yeah, yeah. I don't want to necessarily say it's about it's Kurt's fault. It's not, it's Kurt's, Kirk's fault. This person's fault. But if the team had done a better job investing in interior linemen, then we wouldn't have these problems. Kirk cousins wouldn't have been sped up. He wouldn't have taken the hits and kind of, you know, butterflying affected forward, then he would have still been chill, calm, come second half. I guess, yeah, I'll start with the QB first on this. I guess, what are your thoughts on on that? Kind of coming out of halftime, yeah, and just generally speaking, when we talk about the O-line and where we are season to date and, you know, what else the team could have done. Um, yeah, I guess, what are your thoughts on, on those takes that were kind of flying around today that, you know, I'm, I'm going to say it's your fault that you got people so charged up <laughs> sharing those, those stats out there. But, uh yeah, I guess if we had a better interior offensive line, would Kirk Cousins have, have just basically played better that, that series in the, in the, the third quarter? Jason, uh, real quick, um, just because I, uh, there was something good that was that kind of sparked my brain about the last topic real fast. Um, you, you, you kind of talked a little bit about leadership and about, you know, not really having a guy on that side of the ball that can that can do that. And I guess I'm, I'm coming to Kirk's. Um, defense in this in this respect, where um, I just I don't I don't really see Kirk as a rah rah type leader. You know, I don't I don't I don't see him as the guy that might be able to, um, you know, really just get guys fired up and all other stuff. I, I still think that he can be a leader in a very different way. Um, but I, I just I just don't know if that's part of his personality. I know that we've seen all these clips with the you know the Vikings montages and stuff, and obviously that first one, you know, it it, it was good. I, I think it, it felt very authentic. But then subsequently afterward, it definitely felt a lot more forced because I don't think that that's who he is. That's his personality. But I still think he can be a leader, and I think he's shown aspects of leadership. I just don't know if he's the guy that's going to do that and and it's really weird to say because we always think about it being the quarterback that has to do that and i i still think that kirk can be a leader even if he's not the guy that's going to be the person to fire up the tire sidelines when they are you know maybe they are down you know 14 points or whatever the case is so um oh yeah no doubt and just to be clear like that wasn't you know like a a shot at kirk because a conversation we had last season as well it's just like who are the vets on this team that are leaders period like we have the captains like who are these? Who are the? Who are those guys on this team? Uh, was really kind of what I was I was trying to get to because it seems unclear when things are bad who the leaders are on this team. Is really where I was at with it. So, yeah, I yeah I understand. Right. Yeah. So circling back, Jr. Offensive line. How yeah. important is it? What should the Vikings have done differently? If the offensive line was a little bit better, where Kirk Cousins not have some of these issues that we've seen him have, where he does get sped up. Um, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts on on those takes as it pertains to Kirk Cousins, the team building strategy of the team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, the only bad thing about that with Kirk Cousins is that that's an issue that's not going to get better. Just speaking on his mental processing, that's pretty much a habit at this point. But the good thing about that is that he doesn't look at the rush in the pocket, which is a great thing. He doesn't look at the D lineman coming at him which is a really a really great trait that you can't teach, but he doesn't have a clock that goes off in his head. 
it's usually three to four seconds for a quarterback. I'm pretty sure it's much quicker than that for an NFL guy, but he's just hanging back there for far too long. And what you see is that those offensive linemen are getting pushed back into him so he can't necessarily see what's going on down the field. Or if he does see what's going on down the field, he just has to make a miraculous throw with a million people in his lap or falling into him. So he just needs to somehow find a way to get that ball out quicker because it's only going to help this porous offensive line in front of him and the timing of the routes and the throws that's going on within the scheme. Um, But as far as the Vikings offensive line, I don't know how they could improve it right now, but maybe something Rick Spielman could improve upon is that he could go away from his philosophy of not taking interior offensive linemen before the second round or the third round. And maybe he could, get a guy in the first round, but that's just something that he's never done. So I'm not sure if he's ever going to change that type of philosophy just because that's just how he was brought up. And that's the philosophy that he's been taught even in his days back with the Dolphins. So I don't expect that to change, but it's going to be interesting to see exactly how he builds depth or what spots he does draft up front. That's uh okay. And miles, you were, you were in the trenches today. You were in the trenches. <laughs> talking team building, talking offensive line, talking everything. And I, yeah, I'm interested in your take. Obviously, I feel like you guys probably all know mine. I feel like we probably, you know, we overvalue the importance of offensive line. Once you get to a certain point, they just can't be the worst. But once they're not like the absolute worst, you can be okay. Like our offensive line has been bad for the last three seasons, and our quarterbacks have put up career best numbers in each of those seasons with, you know, a horrible offensive line in each of those seasons. But Miles, you were in there working it out, arguing, going back and forth, debating, all that good stuff. What are your thoughts on kind of the take that, yo, it's the offensive line's issue, not necessarily Kirk Cousins. And if we fix that offensive line, Kirk Cousins will become Tony Robo. <laughs> um, well, I I think they're, they, they tie each other themselves hand in hand. I think, obviously, the better the offensive line, the, the more the quarterback's going to feel secure, um, especially someone like Kirk Cousins to where Jarrett's point is that he he does struggle the, with that internal clock because he sometimes might feel that he has more time and not be able to feel that pressure. So obviously a better offensive line, guys that can hold their pass box a little bit longer, um, that's going to that's gonna help someone like Kirk Cousins because he's going to be able to get through his progressions um, without having to – and hold on the ball just a little bit longer. I'm not saying that's something he should be doing, but that's the kind of quarterback he is. Um, but I, yeah, obviously they, we, we know the offensive line needs to be better. Um, but like Jason said that it's not the worst when everybody's healthy. And I think that's where people are misunderstanding is this offensive line. Every, not everybody's healthy. You're missing your left tackle. You're obviously starting left guard is a backup anyways, even though he's exceeded expectations. Um, your right guard is playing out of position. Um, and your right tackle has been Rashad Hill and, and a rookie Brian O'Neill. So let's not let's not pretend like it's um, it's been perfect. Obviously, and I'm I'm not saying that they should they couldn't have done more to try to make it better, but the the ways that they could have done that would have been re- would have been really hard for them to do. Would have, would have sacrificed potential future draft picks. Would have would have sacrificed 2018 draft picks to do what exactly and that's kind of my point is like what what are you getting out of the uh, out of a first round rookie guard this year that's going to drastically change what this offensive line is right now and i'm not saying for the future that's not a positive thing i'm not saying it guys can't get better but what would it done for right now because i don't know i that that's an answer nobody nobody knows but it's also one of those answers where, shoot, <laughs> is it really that you know drastic? And I don't think it is because you're not getting a Quentin Nelson. You're not. They would have had to trade a lot to get someone like Frank Ragnow or Billy Price. And yes, those guys have played well, especially Ragnow. But I, I'm just not sure it, it changes drastically what this team team's offensive line would have been capable of. And I know, Jason, to your point, you've talked about it. The tackles are the ones that are the most important because of the outside pressure um, that worry me the most. And, you know, Riley Reef being banged up as often as he, he has has really hurt 
this offensive line, in my opinion, more more than it has been a guy like Tom Compton. So, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what they could have done completely different that's realistic because um, then you're just hurting you're – for, you're foregoing all the other positions that you needed help at, whether it was for depth or whether it was for guys that you needed to start. You know, Mike Hughes at one point was a day one starter. Um, we, he obviously got hurt. And then Brian O'Neill – who's had to start the last few games and come in for a leaf on a few games. Um, that's been important for this team. If you're willing to sacrifice those two players for one, one interior offensive lineman, I'm not sure that's, you know, that's a realistic act. Yeah. And it's always the fun part of, I think it's like, you know, we, we, we fall in love with the players come draft time. And I know I'm, I'm guilty of these things, you know, as well, but like, yeah, we, uh, we can admit Will Hernandez at this point in the season is playing a little bit better than Tom Compton. But like the gap, when you again we're looking at Pro Football Focus grades because that's what we have. The gap from a grade perspective isn't huge, you know. Like Hernandez is coming in at slightly above average, and Compton is coming in slightly below average. Like, like to your point, what is like? What is the difference that you're going to get for an offense overall from a slightly below average guard to a slightly above average guard? And then Frank Ragnow is graded below both of them. So, <laughs> like, if, you know, Compton was the issue, Remmers, we, we all, all of us, I think on, on, on this podcast anyway, disagreed with the idea that we could should just move Remmers to, to guard and he'd be good there. Um, so, I mean... But that's something the team decided they were going to do, and so that was that's that's what it is. Like that's what the team decided. That's what they wanted to do, and uh, we all disagree with it. I think everyone, most everyone, disagreed with that idea. But you know, we got potentially our right tackle of the future. But uh, yeah, Jr. Going forward, we're going to need you to put some more context around these Kirk Cousin pressure numbers because uh, apparently it's a trigger for uh, for uh, all guards matter Vikings Twitter. And uh, yeah, and Miles too apparently because you know he spent his afternoon fighting <laughs> with people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was just pro football focus putting up the total pressure numbers. I didn't look at the entire number of attempts for each team because that does factor in some. But the top three were Kirk Cousins. I forget who was second. Pretty sure I think it was, it was Eli Manning or Deshaun Watson. Yeah, Eli Deshaun. Manning was there. Yeah. So those guys were the top three. And um, I just thought that was pretty interesting because of the disparity between all of them. Kirk Cousins was at the top with like 155. And I believe Deshaun was like 143. And Eli was like 125 or 126. And we all talk about how bad all three of those offensive lines are at this point. And I didn't expect the Vikings to be that far at the top. I did expect them to be in, in the top five, but I didn't expect Cousins to be taking that many hits and for them to be at the top at such farther from Deshaun Watson and Eli Manning. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And what's really fun is that when you go and you make it a percentage, so what percentage of their draft backs are they under pressure? Deshaun Watson goes to the top of the list at 45%. Kirk Cousin comes in at uh, number two at uh, basically 41%. Dak Prescott comes in at number three. And are people really out there saying like the Cowboys didn't invest in like in their line? Rosen again, their line is trash, so that's not surprising at forty percent. Case Keenum, Denver, thirty six percent, right? Like, and even within those quarterbacks, that that group of quarterbacks right there, you have you know Deshaun and Kirk. Who, when you look at their raw numbers, they look okay, right? Like they're playing. The top two guys are playing pretty decent, even yeah, in spite of the fact that they're under pressure all the time. Yeah, they are. Because, both of those guys are playing. Well. I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah, but both, both of those guys are playing well right now. But those other teams you talk about, they've invested heavily in their offensive line. Denver has invested a first round pick yep. in their offensive line. We all know the Cowboys have built their line over time. Travis Frederick isn't playing right now, but they still have some first rounders on their offensive line. So it's not necessarily meaning if you invest first rounders in your offensive line that it is going to be elite and even with the Cowboys investing so much in their offensive line they haven't won any playoff games but they have they have injuries to the line guys like 
<laughs> oh wait we do too oh yeah that's right <laughs> but yeah and then there's another part of this too that we're not going to get in this because again i don't want people to feel like this is the yo dog and on kirk cousins or anything like that but there is um shoot i think it was football outsiders i feel like it was football outsiders but i'll find it um but there is something to be said this one of the things they say is that um pressure can sometimes also be a quarterback and or scheme stat because if you look at the other side of that list um you know, the bottom three in terms of pressure. Yes, they have good offensive lines, but it's Drew Brees, Ben Roethlisberger, Tom Brady, and they tend to be towards the bottom of that list in terms of, you know, sacks taken, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Either, even as the quality of player in front of them, um, you know, changes or shifts because, you know, they just kind of learn if it's not there, get rid of it, you know, throw it away, whatever. Um, just get, you know, first read, second read gone before the pressure can get to them type of thing. So um, there's something to that as well, but, Ultimately, when you look at Deshaun Watson, you know, up until this past week, having a Will Fuller, having, you know, a nuke, uh, and then Kirk having Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen, they're under a ton of pressure, but they're able to ball because, you know, get those weapons. Offensive line, you can figure that out after you find your weapons. But anywho, we've talked enough about that. Let's get to this upcoming game. JR, the Lions are coming in for whatever reason. This is a team that has had our number, even though I feel like we've been a better team than them for a minute now. They tend to give us tough games. Occasionally, Golden Tate used to do things that would embarrass us. He's not there anymore. Hallelujah. What are your thoughts on this game? What are you looking at? What are the key matchups? What do we need to do to come out with this victory? Yeah, and they have plenty of motivation this week, speaking about the Vikings, because they've never beaten this team at U.S. Bank Stadium. So that's motivation in itself. And, of course, it's their second divisional game. Uh, so they have an opportunity to get a leg up on this crazy division that's flip-flopping every single week. You could be in first place, one, first place one week and then fourth place the next week. So this is a big game for the Vikings. Um, just watching the Lions on film, they're a completely different team this year, just speaking on their identity, because they've always been heavy, heavily reliant on Matthew Stafford and him just throwing the ball all over the yard. But that's not the case this year. Their passing numbers are still decent, but they're running the football much more efficiently this year. Carry on Johnson has come in and he's done a very good job for them. I think he's going to be a star for them uh, down the road. They've lightened his workload a little bit because they're still mixing like Garrett Blunt in there from time to time because Matt Patricia doesn't want to put a heavy workload on carry on Johnson so early on in his career, but they're running the football very efficiently. Frank Ragnar, who's a first round pick from this year, is starting to pick up his play over the past few weeks. Um, they took an L last week to the Seahawks, but they still did some really good things in that game. Uh, the previous two weeks, they did have a pretty good win streak going on, and they've done some good things. Um, their big acquisition at the trade deadline, Snacks Harrison, I thought he was up and down, but he's going to make that defense much better. Um, just from a run game standpoint, he's going to try to clog the middle, but they still have some good pieces on their defense. Darius Slay is still a good player. He's playing at a really high level right now. Uh, Tavon Wilson and Glover Quinn are always going to be good players on the back end of their defense. And, of course, they still have Ziggy Ansah as well. Um, but I think the one player that's going to give the Vikings some real troubles now that Golden Tate is gone is going to be Kenny Galladay. And, Jason, I know that's your guy. You were a big fan of Galladay coming out um, in the draft. But I think he's going to end up being a really good player for the Lions, and I'm excited to see him in this new role as basically their complementary piece to Marvin Jones. And I think he does present some issues. Oh. <sighs> That's going to be sad. I, I don't want to watch Kenny destroy us. I really hope that doesn't happen. I might shed a tear. Miles, you know, we're talking wide receivers. What are, what are your thoughts on kind of the, how we're going to line up, how we're going to match up? Now, we already kind of talked about Golden Tate being gone. Do you know who might replace him in that role in the offense? And then Marvin, Kenny, RDBs, what are you thinking about how that matchup's going to go down? Yeah, I'll start with. Um, I was really surprised that they did trade that they did trade uh, Golden Tate. I just thought I understand the trade for the for for the fact that they they're in a position where they probably aren't going to resign him at the end of the year. He's thirty years old. Um, probably got outpriced for him a little bit, or would have would have been outpriced for him a little bit. So getting getting the most value for him while you can made sense, but. He was just that catalyst that helped create. He he created plays for that offense in the short to intermediate, and he he's the type of player who you know you just get the ball in his hands and and he creates and he gets you positive yardage. 
on almost every play. Um, so I, I was really surprised by that because he's, you know, he's been with Stafford for, what, four or five years now. Um, so it was something that, you know, they had a lot of investment on him, that offense, you know, with, with Stafford and that chemistry. But like you guys mentioned, Kenny Galladay is really coming and and he's really shined this year. He's really looked like, you know, at, at different points throughout the season, each one of those top three receivers have looked like the number one receiver, you know, on any given week. But you could tell that that upside by Kenny Galladay is higher than any receiver that they have. And so I can understand why they'd want to open up some more opportunities for him because he can get downfield. He can stretch the field. He could be your big possession receiver as well. He's that prototypical number one receiver you look for, can win one-on-one matchups against um, all, all sorts of DBs. So um, I, I understand that aspect of it. It, it was just kind of surprising to see to see them let him walk, well, to let him go, to let Golden Tate go um, in the midst of them being really close to or in a tight um, NFC North race. But what, what it looks like they're probably going to do is um, guys like uh, Brandon Powell, who was a, a college free agent this year, and uh, I think this is his fourth year in the league now, fourth, third or fourth year. Uh, TJ Jones, their wide receiver out of, Notre Dame. Um, he's been around for a while. It looks like they're going to probably rotate those guys around a little bit. They don't have much depth at the wide receiver position, though. So that that kind of hurts them a little bit. Um, so you're going to see TJ Jones and Brandon Powell get, get a lot of reps, and then it looks like they'll probably play a lot more two tight end sets with Luke Wilson, um, Levine Toilolo, or, you know, in a combination of Michael Roberts. Uh, that That's the big part, and, and like what JR said is they want to run the ball a lot more. <clears throat> so getting a guy like Golden Tate off the team allows you to be more in two wide receiver in 22 personnel or 21 personnel, you know, two tight end sets and allowing you to run the ball a little bit more, be a little bit more creative out of um, a tight formation is, is going to be a little bit more important for this offense, the way they want to control the clock, um, help their defense out in that sense. And I think that's a big reason why they got people uh, – they brought in someone like Snacks Harrison is they want to con- they want to control the clock. They want to slow things down and not put it all on on Matthew Stafford like we've seen. So that that's where I really see that this uh, this offense is looking to go. And then you flip it on the Vikings side – Oh well, and you flip it on the Vikings defensive side. You know, if Xavier Rhodes is good to go, it really looks like he's probably going to shadow Marvin Jones because – He's the known commodity. He's the veteran. He's the he's a big play guy too. So that's the kind. That's the guy I see. You know, if they do shadow Xavier Rhodes, that's the guy I see him shadowing. So it's going to be a tall task for a guy like Trey Wayne to go up against Kenny Galladay if that's the case. So that that's something that worries me a little bit, um, just because we've seen we've seen our defensive backs, whether it's some of the corners or some of the safeties, misplay some of those deep balls, misplay some of those jump balls and allow some of these receivers to make those plays. And that's really been worrisome for me. Um, so, and I, and we know Matthew Stafford is not afraid to throw the ball up to those guys, no matter who's covering them. So that, that's something that worries me a little bit. And then you flip it over to the Viking side. I really see, you know, if it sounds like Stefan Diggs should be good to go rib injury. Hopefully that's just a pain tolerance thing. Um, that'll determine to me whether Darius Slay covers him or not. If Darius Slay on the outside covers Stefan Diggs, um, it's going to leave uh, Adam Thielen on Quandre Diggs, their, the, their nickel corner who they've just re-signed. So that's going to be a good matchup as well. He's a pretty solid player. I don't think he's someone that can stop Adam Thielen on a down-in and down basis, but um, he's, he's, he's solid in his own right. Um, so I really think they're going to try to take away that slot with Quandre Diggs and you know potentially another guy over the top just to make sure that he doesn't um, he doesn't take care of business there because if Diggs is be- is beaten up a little bit, they might not be as worried about him taking advantage of downfield opportunities, especially if they have a good guy like uh, Darius Slay on him. So it's really going to open up things for the tight end and the third wide receiver, whether it's Treadwell or Aldrick Robinson. And then if they can get the the running backs um, involved, I think the – and Jason, you might know a little bit better than me. Um, I think the linebackers have struggled against um, the pass. The, for the for the Lions, 
looks like they struggle against the everything right now. Yeah. So <laughs> <if you> can, <laughs> even better. So like if you can take advantage of that with Kyle Rudolph or you know your running backs, I'm 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 low key kind of hoping Dalvin Cook doesn't go this week just because I would like him to get that full that full extra week plus the buy to kind of just make sure that he's good to go. Um, I would hate to have a setback before the buy. That just you know that really hurt everything. So I'd rather just him sit out. Uh, but if you could get a guy like Mike Boone into space with some of those linebackers, that could be really uh, troublesome for them. Okay, and uh, Saxy Prince, because we know how much you love, love, love talking about the quarterbacks. And, you know, JR, he talked running backs a little bit. Miles talked about the receivers. I need you to let me know what you're going to be looking at in this matchup of the perennially underrated Matthew Stafford and our man Kirk Cousins. <clears throat> well, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't. If I didn't mention, you know, a hometown hero returning uh, in Matt Castle, you know, he he's coming back from, you know, basically being one of our, you know, one of our guys for like a season and a half. So got to mention Matt Castle because he did so much for this organization over his season and three games. <clears throat> Anyways, well, if you don't get to this analysis. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I. um I, I think this is a this is a game that I'm I'm actually excited for Kirk Cousins. Um, I, I think Miles kind of outlined you know some of the matchups and whatnot, and this is something that you know would be, be would be a game where I could definitely see Kirk Cousins kind of being on tempo a little bit more so than not. Um, but I, I think that you know Matt Stafford, I would say he's if he's a he's a, he's a I think it's somewhat of a similar quarterback in in the respects of they when you rank the, the quarterbacks from where they fall into, you know Kirk probably falls into maybe just inside the top ten or right at ten, um, and Matthew Stafford is probably in that you know, <clears throat> and, and, and over his career has, has kind of fallen into that you know anywhere between eleven to thirteen. So there, I mean, I think there's similar quarterbacks in the way in you know where they rank as far as you know uh, a few of their stats, but I, I think Kirk Cousins is going to be the is going to be the better quarterback on this day. I think he has he obviously has um, a better wide receiver like duo, um, but you know prior to Golden Tate being being gone, I think a lot of people were touting their wide receiver cr- group as probably like the best trio in the league. Um, <clears throat> I think. Uh, you know, if Dalvin Cook can't go, um, I could still see uh, Matthew, Matthew Stafford being really able to, you know, take take advantage of his his some of his wide receivers who are not wide receivers, running backs who can catch. I think Karrion Johnson is fantastic. You can get him out of the backfield. Um, Legarrette Blunt as well, maybe not as much Amir Dula, but uh, Theo Riddick has, has been kind of a thorn in the Viking side for a while. Um, I, I I would not be surprised if you you see the Vikings take. Or not the Vikings, but the um, the Lions to take a uh, few shots down the field. Not having Xavier Rhodes, I think Matthew Stafford is probably going to be a little bit more aggressive during this game, um, which is going to test guys like you know Holton Hill. Will test guys like you know Mac Alexander in the slot. Um, but I just don't think that he's going to find as much success against the against the Vikings uh, in this coming season or this coming game. Um, overall, um, like I said, I still think I I, I would pick. Um, I, I would still pick Kirk Cousins, you know, Matthew Stafford, you know, he's roughly at a, you know, 68% completion percentage. Hold on one second. Hold on. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't, you know, sometimes these headphones be acting up, but if you could, if you could just say that one more time, you, you said, what were you saying about the quarterbacks? Who are you going to pick? Um, so Matthew Stafford has thrown 14 touchdowns and, uh, you know, six interceptions on the season, but he is kind of completing that, uh, <laughs> uh, he is has a sixty eight percentage completion percentage. Uh, so I, I I do feel as if he you know, despite you know their their win loss record, you know Matthew Stafford has at times played very well against the Vikings and you know trash. And I think this is probably going to be a game where he um, kind of has kind of an up and down game. Um, I think the Vikings defense is starting to click. So I mean, this is going to be something where because you're forcing me to repeat it again, I think Kirk Cousins is going to be the better quarterback on the day. There it is. That's all we wanted to hear. Did we, though? I mean, a little bit. I, I know Woo. Reddit. I know the people on Reddit wanted to hear it, Yinka. Woo! Yeah, they, they definitely did. You got, a, you got a name over there, my man. Somehow, some way. 
I, psh, I I'm, I'm, I'm either doing all the right things or all the wrong things. So. They would say, they would say the wrong things, you know. But whatever, whatever. You, our white friends vouch for you on the last pod, so you're good now. You're good. But I'm gonna yeah, start with you. <laughs> I'm gonna start with you on this one. Uh, what is your score prediction? What is your bold prediction? Yeah, I will say the Vikings are gonna win to the tune of. It's probably gonna be some weird score. I think. I think it's gonna be like. Uh, twenty six to uh, um eighteen, Vikings. Um, so Vikings win and cover. Okay, good stuff. And I think, what I think, um, I think we're gonna see a wide receiver throw a touchdown in this game. <clears throat> I think. Uh, Either Adam Thielen or Stephon Diggs is going to throw a touchdown in this game. It's going to be some trick play. You mean Treadwell? Because he, we've seen him throw in the in college. Have we seen Thielen or Diggs throw the ball? See, that's all the more surprise. They ain't oh, expected there it. We there we go. Treadwell. Are, are we switching it to Treadwell? Or are you just going to stay with wide receiver? We'll go with uh, wide receiver. Yeah, okay. let's just stay with wide receiver. Okay. Well, Miles, you ready to go? You hopping in? Score prediction, bowl prediction. Um. Let's go 24 ah, 24 16 Vikings. Let's covering. go. Covering. What what's the spread? I think it's like minus seven. That's or is it yeah, it's a minus seven? That feels Wasn't high. That feels or high. Or did, did it start at minus seven and then it that feels really it, high. Yeah, no, it started higher, it got bet down. It was at five point oh shoot, is it five point five yesterday? It's been bet down to five now. Okay, because I know what home teams get like three, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay, that that the five makes more sense than seven. Um, but uh, my bold prediction will be what's a bold prediction? Kyle Rudolph has a hundred yards this week and a touch and two touchdowns. <laughs> oh, Miles! That, that that one hurt me. That one hurt me last week. I know. I know. That hurt me last week. You know, Kyle but got like, that touchdown. I was like, game. "Yeah, this should be the type of game he he eats." And two touchdowns, and then next week people will tell us he is a top five tight end in the league. Jr. Yeah, he's better than George Kittle, apparently. Well, yes. Uh, yes. I'm gonna go 27-24 Vikings. Uh, bold prediction. No cover for Jr. Okay. I say, let's do something off the wall. I say Daniel Hunter gets a pick six. I like it. Okay, and I am going to go. I like JR's score a little bit, but I can't just take it. So I'm going to go 27 23 Vikings. And I'm going to have Everson Griffin forcing a fumble that will be recovered by J. Ron Curse in return for a touchdown. We're going super specific here. Force fumble. Return for a TV. That feels like one of those like bets in Vegas that like if you put like five dollars on and it happened, you win like ten thousand dollars. I need to go see if I can find a site that will let me put that bet in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it feels like. That's so specific. Super specific. I and mean, and you know, if you do end up in New Orleans, we'll make sure that you 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 get all of our bold predictions so you can place the bets for us for that week. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, gentlemen, was there anything we missed? Anything else you guys want to cover before we get up out of here? I know that, you know, there's the end of this rousing Thursday night game that you guys all want to get back to. No? Good. JR, I saw already that you retweeted that uh, your uh, appearance on Purple for the Win will be coming out tomorrow. If you haven't already checked it out, Miles was on Purple for the Win on Tuesday. Make sure you check that out. I had an article drop talking about our man Kirk Cousins. Call him a top 10 quarterback, so calm down. Don't just read the title. Our man, Matt Anderson, did some more uh, awesome analysis for us on the timeline, which he then parlayed into an article, which dropped this week. Of course, we got the Scolders podcast. Good morning, Gallahorn should be coming up here soon. Check out their last one. Ted, Drew, the, the In The Raw episodes, the ones that come right after the game are awesome because they're always really drunk, so you never know what they're going to say. 
they have their next episode coming up shortly. Miles is, you know, he's working on some stuff for it that'll be coming out here before too long. And uh, Prince, anything we should be looking out for for you? You know, you dropped one recently, but uh, anything else you got cooking up? Uh, nothing as of now. Uh, I'm still kind of working on uh, a Daniel Hunter, Daniel Hunter uh, piece. Um, so that on the football side of things, um, there might be uh, um, some other, uh, you know, acting related opportunities that have potential not potentially it's, it's coming my way so i'll announce it when it's when it's out but it's some exciting stuff so wakanda forever it worked it worked I'm yeah you just have to you, know. you, you just have to a, buy marvel that's you know, all you, you have see, to do you see the movie a thousand times and they will put you in it as an extra that's i'm, I'm you know what i feel i feel good for you prince a thousand and nine okay all right a thousand and nine all right, well, that's it. That's all. I got some of my uh, my children's candy to go and steal after this podcast here. Uh, so uh, we'll wrap that's it up. That's your children's candy. <laughs> oh, dude. They came back with like a box, like a big box full of candy when it was all said and done. So, yeah. They, their memories aren't very good. By the end of the weekend, half of that will be transferred someplace else. And by next weekend, some more of it will be transferred. And then, you know, they'll get the rest of it. Don't want to give them you know, diabetes. It's too much candy. But uh, yeah, that's it. That's all. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on. Listeners, thanks for sticking with us. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Have a good one.